Often we write object-oriented programs that, in memory, keep their data in objects that reference one another, but that are persisted into a relational database, into a database that is based on tables. And those tables have rows where each row in a table has the same set of columns. This causes something of a mismatch between how the data is represented in memory and how it's represented in the database. So for instance, on this next slide, I'm going to show the representation in memory on the left and the representation in the database on the right. I've used JSON, JavaScript object notation, as a shorthand way of writing down what the object structure in memory might look like. And so here we have students, and here we have a student whose name is Algernon Moncrief and has an ID of one, and that student is taking two classes. And those classes are of the, the course class, and uh, one of them has ID 1 and one of them has ID 2. Uh, but that class is that's an array that contains references to objects in memory. That might be stored in the database, in a relational database, like this. We have a student table that has the ID and that has the name Algernon Moncrief, but doesn't have the classes in it. The reason it doesn't have the classes is because this table needs to have a, uh, a fixed set of columns, however many that we choose. Uh, but that classes array can have a variable number of entries in it. They might sign up, the student might sign up to three more classes, and so we would need to put three more classes into that array. Where would we store them if we only have a fixed set of columns? So instead, we have to have this uh, association table down the bottom, student course, which contains a row for each of the classes for each of the students, associating the student with that class. So it's a little bit of a different representation, uh, whereas on the left, in the memory representation, we had uh, an array of classes where those are direct references to other objects in memory. In the database, we have a separate association table that has foreign key references. It has the key of the student on the left and the key of the student, uh, sorry, the key of the class on the right, in the class column on the right. If you have been programming using the data access object pattern, uh, then you're probably quite used to the idea that you would have a data access object that is responsible for saving and loading objects from the database. And so it is responsible for invoking the queries on the database and handling this mapping. What do we need to do to get a student? What do we need to do to save a student? What do we need to do to get a course? What do we need to do to save a course? Very often, we write programs that have the same sort of mappings. There's kind of common conventions uh, in how these mappings are done. And so one of the observations for object relational mapping is perhaps we shouldn't hand code those mappings. Rather than hand code how we read and write each class to the database, perhaps we could get something else to do that for us automatically. So that's the basis behind object relational mapping. Something is going to handle that mapping between the representations for you. In Java, there's JPA, Java Persistence API. Uh, there's a number of different uh, implementations of JPA. Uh, Hibernate is, uh, is one of the uh, better known ones, but there's a number of different implementations. But uh, it's a relatively simple standard, and I'm going to show you parts of that standard. So in JPA, uh, the assumption is that your data is Java beans. Uh, so here we have a person class, and that person has a name property, and there is a getter and there is a setter for that property. And I've put an annotation on the class person at entity, and that means that this is an entity that we're interested in persisting to and from the database. The other annotation that you can see on this slide is not null. In Java, if you have a reference to an object, including a reference to a string, that reference could be null. Uh, so the mapper, the object relational mapper, needs to know whether that is allowed to be null in the database. Should that map to a column that can take a null, or should it map to a column that has a, a not null requirement on it and the database will complain if you try and uh, set that property to null and save it? 
Uh, so that's the use of the not null annotation there. In this case, string is going to turn into a var char column in the person table. On the next slide, uh, I've added another annotation to our uh, class. I've added at table name equals people. And all that is going to do is going to rename the table that this creates in the database. So instead of calling it person after the class, it's going to call it people. But I've also put in this protected person mother, protected person father. That's a little bit different because that is a reference to another entity. It's not just a string that's just going to turn into a string column. This is a reference to another entity, and so it's going to be a foreign key in the database. Even in this case, a foreign key to um, uh, to another row of the people table. That relationship uh, could be one to one, it could be many to one, or, or it could be many to many, uh, or it could be one to many. In this case, we have protected person mother. I have one mother, protected person father. I have one father. And so clearly, clearly in that case, it either has to be many to one or one to one. Uh, it's not one to many because it would, it would need to be a list there. In this case, it's many to one. Although I have one mother, my mother happens to have more than one child. I, I have siblings. And so in this case, it, it's a many to one, and that annotation tells uh, tells JPA to expect that this should be many to one. Uh, in practice, what that's going to turn into is if this was one to one, then we might have a unique con constraint on the column. Uh, whereas if we have many to one, there's not a unique constraint on the column that represents the, the, the mother foreign key reference, uh, because there may be other rows in the table that have the same mother and so have the same foreign key in that column. In brackets here, optional equals true. That means that potentially my mother might not be a row in the table, so that that, uh, that column might be blank for, for my entry uh, in, in, in the database. And fetch equals fetch type dot lazy. I'll get to what that is in a little while. On this slide, I've shown you the other side of the relationship. So here is the one-to-many relationship. And uh, one-to-many needs to have a, a mapped by. So a one-to-many is always the other end of a many-to-one. And so one-to-many mapped by equals mother, because on the previous slide, uh, many-to-one, the, the property was called mother. And target entity is class of person. Uh, we've also added there to say that you know we, we're referring to a person. The reason that ends up needing to be there is because although we have list of person as the type at compile time, in Java uh, the generics are erased at runtime. So at runtime that's just a list, list of object, mother of, and uh, we we need to tell JPA uh, what sort of class. Uh, it, it should be expecting at the other, other side. So we end up needing to specify the target entity is class of person because due to type erasure, it can't just get it from the, um, the type that the, the list refers to. In this case here, I've now got some trivial data, nickname and hats owned. And I've said that this is embedded. What embedded means is that this isn't an entity of its own. It doesn't get its own table. If you see something that has some trivial data in it, just add a couple of columns, nickname and hats owned, uh, rather than giving them their own table or their own and their own association tables to, to, to link them up. On this slide, uh, we're starting to get into some things that are particular about databases. So in a database, there tends to be an ID uh, column, a, a, a primary key for this particular item. Those primary keys can be allocated in a number of different ways. One of the very common ways is to ask the database to allocate the ID for you. And perhaps the database just starts at one and counts upwards. As, as you add new rows, it just keeps counting up and up and up and up. And this uh, annotation here, at generated value strategy equals generation type dot auto, will essentially let the um, the JPA implementation and normally the, let the database do that, and it'll just auto auto increment the uh, counter as entities are saved into the database. 
However, this can cause a couple of problems. One of them is if, suppose, your software becomes incredibly popular and you end up running 50 different machines all serving your program and they're saving data into the database. Um, but if that ID is an incremented counter, then if requests come in to create new people on all 50 uh, of those servers, then these requests to the database are going to, going to end up needing to be queued up somehow because we want the, the counter to increment uniquely across all of them. And so you, you end up with a situation where potentially uh, your database might end up needing to be a little bit of a, a bottleneck there. Typically, that's not too bad. But there's a second issue that comes up, which is um, a little bit more awkward to deal with for programmers. And that's that if you're asking the database to allocate your IDs, then if you create an object in memory, it doesn't have an ID yet. It doesn't have an ID until you've saved it to the database and the database has allocated one. And that can potentially cause uh, odd little snags, depending on how you define equals for your person. Um, are two persons that have the same name equal uh, if they don't have IDs yet? Two, we get two requests to create people called Algernon Moncrief, and we put them into some kind of a collection, a set, and we want to go and get Algernon Moncrief out. How do we know we've got the right Algernon Moncrief if these are two different people who just both happen to have the same name? Um, but unless we've saved them down to the database, they don't have an ID field to distinguish them on that. And so you'd occasionally find people that would write programs where when they created an item, they needed to save it to the database just to give it an ID before they then do some w things with it and then update it in the database. Another strategy that you could use is to allocate the ID in your program. You could use universally unique identifiers. And the idea here is that you have an identifier that is either random or is generated according to a particular strategy, perhaps the, the time at the beginning and the machine name and then some incremented counter on that machine. But you make it so that it is astronomically unlikely that two machines allocating IDs completely independent and not uh, independently and not knowing about each other would happen to allocate the same ID, make it astronomically unlikely that the same ID would get allocated twice, uh, that you'd have a collision. And so that, that's another strategy that you could use for how you generate IDs. And in that case, you have the advantage that you have an ID as soon as you've created the item. You don't need to persist it to the database to get an ID. So I mentioned the data access object pattern before, and I mentioned how very often you might write a program and you end up writing this data access object that's going to deal with getting data to and from the database. In JPA, you don't need to write that data access object. Uh, there's an entity manager and the JPA implementation, the JPA provider, uh, has an entity manager and that is your data access object. And so that is the object that you call to ask it to fetch uh, things from the database and save things to the database. So for example, we might have person George is entity manager dot find person dot class one two three four. Let's get person number 134, uh, one two three four, sorry, out of the database. If we wanted to create a person and save them, we might say, well, person P is new person of Algernon Moncrief. And if this is a new object, I might ask the entity manager to persist it by saying entity manager dot persist of p. Or if I was updating an existing object, I would say entity manager dot merge of well of p in this case. I, I wrote foo there to suggest it's a different one because it might be confusing just to see. Well, hang on, we've just created it just there. We we know that that one's not persisted. We've just created it. Um, but so if we are updating existing objects, we say merge instead of persist. Very often when dealing with databases, we want a transaction so that uh, either all of our updates 
succeed and are committed or they're all rolled back uh, if one of them fails and this is the code for doing a transaction in jpa entity manager dot get transaction transaction dot begin do some stuff transaction dot commit now the difference between how the data is represented in memory and how it's represented in the database um, is an interesting aspect of JPA and it means that it needs to use something called a proxy pattern. So here we have the family tree of George and George has a, uh, a mini to one reference to uh, mother and father and uh, those are also people so they have mini to one references to mother and father. And we're going to consider what happens when we go George is entity manager dot find person dot class one two three four. And so we get George out of the database. But George has a reference to a father and a mother. And those are of type of class person. So what do we do about that? Do we need to instantiate Kate and William uh, and get those out of the database so that we can populate these references? And well, if we did that, if we instantiated Kate to get that one out of the database, well, Kate would have a reference to her mother and father. Would we need to get Michael and Carol out of the database? And Michael and Carol would have uh, mother and father as well. And so we kind of have this problem of, well, would we have to follow this chain of references and end up accidentally having to populate all of the data from our database just because we wanted to get George out? What should George.father be? It can't be null because we've, we've got an entry for him in the database. What should George.getfather be? But we need George.getfather.getName to return William. Well, this is where this fetch equals fetch type dot lazy comes in. JPA uses lazily loaded proxies. Uh, behind the scenes, the JPA implementation will create a subclass of person that doesn't necessarily have all the data in it. And so the idea is, is that you can have you can get George out of the database and he can have references to Kate and William, except Kate and William aren't proper people yet. They're proxies. They haven't been populated from the database and they will only get populated from the database when you actually ask for one of their properties. Um, so this means that accessing a property can require a database lookup and that these will drop uh, will block the thread for a little while. So JPA like JDBC is synchronous and so when we go to the database we, we make a call and that is likely to block the thread on IO while that call takes place. If you're writing a web application uh, this doesn't mean that the that the servlet can't handle requests anymore. It can still handle requests on other threads. It just means that that thread is blocked waiting for the database to get back to it. So we go and get George and so I've shown George got uh, in black there to show that uh, we, we've populated that object and there is data in it but the references to William and Kate at the moment those aren't um, those aren't populated with data those are references to empty lazily loaded proxies that will only actually go and fetch Kate and William's data from the database when we ask for something that needs it. If we go George.getFather, well, that's just a reference to a lazily loaded proxy at the moment. Uh, but when we go George.getFather.getName, aha, now we need to get the data for William out of the database so that uh, we can populate that name. And of course, when we get William out of the database, that then means that we also need to populate the references to William's mother and father. And so we have lazily loaded proxies for Diana and Charles. And then if we go get father dot get father dot get name, well, then we need to populate Charles. So we need to get Charles out of the database and we have lazily loaded proxies for Phil and Betty. And then if we go get father, George dot get father dot get father dot get mother dot get name, we need to get the data for Betty.